Immigration, migration, border walls, channel crossings, refugee crises, asylum seeking. These hot words tend to dominate the news cycle at the moment, especially in Europe and America. And immigration is a broad topic, one that involves ethics, the philosophy of multiculturalism, the economics of welfare and job markets, crime rates and more. It's also, of course, a controversial topic, so I thought I'd just spend some time just looking at the evidence with an open mind from a wide range of sources on a broad scope of issues. Because in an increasingly globalised world, an increasingly unequal world, a world that could become even more inhospitable in parts, a world looking closer to World War III, not further away from it, understanding this issue is integral to being able to have a progressive plan to tackle a likely continued increase in global migration patterns. In 2015, at the height of the migrant crisis during the Syrian civil war, over a million asylum seekers came to Europe, in 2013, almost 400 died in one incident when a boat sank off the Italian coast. From the election of Trump on the promise of a border wall, or Britain leaving the EU, or Marine Le Pen continuing to do well in France and Orban in Hungary, it's clear from poll after poll that the public wants these numbers reduced and that we don't have a very good progressive narrative that grapples with the topic. And I think we need one. We can see evidence of this in polling in Britain. 77% are in favour of reducing immigration by a little or a lot, and most think the costs of immigration outweigh the benefits. 50 to 70% of respondents across most Western countries report being concerned about illegal immigration. Canadians are outliers here, most having a positive view on immigration. The Canadian government has pursued a policy of multiculturalism for decades. So I want to try and understand where we are, what the data says, be honest about the evidence. I'll keep it simple, but I'll put a link to the sources in the description below the video, organised into categories, and I'll likely keep expanding on that in the future. And in this case, for this particular video, I tried to favour empirical studies and polling over theory and philosophy and so on, although I did include some. Even looking at at least a hundred studies here, I can only scratch the surface. And we have to bear in mind the vast contextual differences between countries and continents. The US having a long border with Mexico is of course going to be different to the UK, an island nation, or Greece, the southern EU border, or Hungary, a country landlocked and surrounded by other countries. I try and draw on a cross-section because of this. But with that in mind, let's get started and see what we can learn. You see this claim a lot, that because there's an increase in the supply of labour and so more competition for jobs, immigration lowers the wages of native residents. OK, here's what I find. It's true that immigration sometimes has a very, quote, small impact on the wages of low-wage workers or those who didn't complete high school. But the evidence for this is minimal and many studies don't find this at all. For example, this study of the UK concluded that we find that immigration depresses wages below the 20th percentile of the wage distribution, but leads to slight wage increases in the upper part of the wage distribution. The overall wage effect of immigration is slightly positive. 
This study finds the same, and another study found that the wage decrease was actually mostly on immigrants already in the country, and that there was no effect on native-born workers. Another study in Australia concluded that, while sparse, the evidence generally indicates that Australians' wages are not adversely affected by immigration on average. And one study of OECD countries, that's higher income countries, in the 90s found that, quote, immigration had a positive effect on the wages of less educated natives and it increased or left unchanged the average native wages. And another 2018 meta-analysis of 12 studies found that Immigration has little or no impact on average employment or unemployment of existing workers. Second, that where an impact is found, it tends to be concentrated among certain groups, i.e. a negative effect for those with lower education and a positive effect for those with higher levels of education. There are also studies of unemployment. One study of OECD countries found that, quote, while no significant long-run impact is found in any case, we find that immigration may have a temporary impact on natives' unemployment, but the amount was negligible, minus 0.02%. One point of interest for studies like this is the Mariel boat lift, which I mentioned in the last video on Tucker Carlson. Hey. It's useful because while a singular event and not representative of migration in general, it does provide the data for an experiment as to what happens when a large group of migrants, in this case 125,000, quickly settle in one area, in this case Miami. Initially, several studies concluded that the effect was negligible or none. However, recently, Harvard economist George Borjas has argued that through the 80s, wages in Miami for those who did not complete high school was 10 to 30 percent lower than elsewhere. But it's important to note that while Borjas is a respected economist, this finding has been controversial and disputed by many others. Looking at the boat lift, this 2017 study concludes that as a whole, the evidence from refugee waves reinforces the existing consensus that the impact of immigration on average native-born workers is small and fails to substantiate claims of large detrimental impacts on workers with less than high school qualifications. Now, Borjas is well known for making the case that immigration benefits some natives while hurting others, particularly benefiting higher earners while hurting lower earners. But in one review of his central books, Immigration Economics, the economist reviewers say that after reading Immigration Economics, one begins to wonder why countries ever decide to have any immigrants, and why many countries continue to allow relatively large inflows of immigrants. Are immigration policies manipulated by an elite who benefit from these policies at the expense of others? Or is the balance of benefits versus costs, even for native workers who are most directly in competition with immigrants, more positive than one might be led to believe from reading Borjas's latest book. We and many other economists come down on the latter side. So it seems like the evidence is ambiguous, but it seems at least very possible that migration in large numbers could affect the wages of low earners, but likely by a very small amount. Rather than reject immigration because of this, the question should become, what could be done about it? But this is a question I didn't see raised much in the literature. Okay, but what about the economy more broadly? This study found that between 1980 and 2000, each immigrant that came into the country added an extra 1.2 jobs to the economy. That's because each new person needs more food and housing and goods and services, and so increases the demand in the economy, and therefore the jobs, because people need to supply that demand. 
but one common claim is that immigrants are a burden on welfare states. Some studies say that non-EU immigrants in the UK cost more in spending than they contribute in taxes, i.e. that they've taken more from the state in welfare and tax credits and other costs than they've paid in in taxes. Although this 2014 UCL study looked at immigrants who have lived in the UK since 2000 and found that they put in 3% more than they took out. And overall, migrants from all countries taken together put in much more than they take out. And one Warwick University study found that migrants in the top 1% of earners contributed 8% of total income tax in the UK. On top of that, the Office for Budget Responsibility in the UK has forecasted that more migration contributes to higher tax receipts over time. Studies like this vary wildly from country to country. This meta-analysis, for example, is all over the place. It says the evidence is mixed and dependent on context, and when it comes to non-EU migrants in the UK, the UK is an outlier. The evidence that migrants pay in more than they take out is stronger in most other countries, including countries like Switzerland, Belgium, Spain and Portugal. Another study looked at several Western European countries between 1985 and 2015 and found that, quote, Inflows of asylum seekers do not deteriorate host countries' economic performance or fiscal balance because the increase in public spending induced by asylum seekers is more than compensated for by an increase in tax revenues. As asylum seekers become permanent residents, their macroeconomic impacts become positive. And this study from 2021 is a good one. It looked at 28,000 Ugandan Asians who came to the UK in the late 1960s. They say there is little research on medium-term outcomes of refugees, which obviously is a bit of a problem. And that, quote, we show that their outcomes are at least as good as the population average, with the younger cohort performing better and better than the economic migrants of the same ethnicity. So again, overall the data is mixed, but I'd say on balance, migration is likely to be a net positive. But we could also look at more social and cultural economic factors, like entrepreneurship and qualifications. How do immigrants fare on the more socio-cultural end? Well, in the US, immigrants are less likely to have finished high school than their native-born counterparts, but are more likely to have a degree. Immigrants are also overrepresented in top management and research positions of top companies, and one survey of 50 of the top companies in the US found that half of them were founded by immigrants, and three quarters had immigrants in top management and research positions. Many studies find that migrants tend to be more entrepreneurial than natives. One study found that they were almost twice as likely to be entrepreneurs in the US than native residents. One study concluded that 7.25% of immigrants were entrepreneurs, compared with about 4% of native-born individuals, and 30% of new entrepreneurs in the US are immigrants. 76% of the top new patents had an author that was foreign-born. This study found that immigrants patent at double the native rate due to their disproportionately holding science and engineering degrees. So it seems that overall, immigrants are more entrepreneurial, innovate more, tend towards science and engineering, are overrepresented in top management positions, and on net, it's likely that they add to the economy and the government balance. So what's next? Okay, 
will breeze through crime because the evidence is pretty clear. This study concludes that in England and Wales, although there is a public sentiment that immigrants are more involved in criminal activities than natives, the empirical results of this paper lead to different conclusions. Uh, this meta-analysis finds that, quote, immigrants facing poor labour market opportunities are more likely to commit property crimes. However, there is no evidence that immigration has caused a crime problem across countries, and immigrants with good labour market opportunities appear no more likely to commit crime than similar natives. It also found that legalising the status of immigrants reduces the likelihood of crime. This review of 20th century studies in the US found that, contrary to the predictions of classic criminological theories and popular stereotypes, immigration generally does not increase crime and often suppresses it. And this study of Texas finds that, contrary to public perception, we observe considerably lower felony arrest rates among undocumented immigrants compared to legal immigrants and native-born US citizens, and find no evidence that undocumented criminality has increased in recent years. Now, in France, Muslims are disproportionately represented in the prison population, 40 to 50 percent of the prison population, when about 10 percent of the population in France are Muslim. But with large scale migration from post colonial Algeria, this is likely to be a result of Muslim men being disproportionately raised in poverty, and so a socio economic fact rather than a cultural one. Although, Facts like this, of course, shouldn't be ignored. Neither should the issues around religious fundamentalism and terrorism, although statistically you're more likely to be crushed by furniture in your house or, of course, die from a car crash. I just want to mention it because I don't want anyone to accuse me of sidestepping these issues. What's clear, though, is that property crime, which accounts for the vast majority of all crimes, is more likely to be committed by desperate people, no matter where they're from, and actually less likely to be committed by immigrants. So, let's move on. Definitions of multiculturalism are difficult to agree upon. One researcher calls the literature decidedly messy. Multicultural can mean a simple demographic fact, multiple cultures in one country. It can mean a philosophy about the equality of cultures, say, or a philosophy about separate cultures living next to one another. It's a difficult topic. In 2010, Angela Merkel famously remarked that multiculturalism had, quote, utterly failed. And one report of 47 EU countries declared that what had until recently been a preferred policy approach, conveyed in shorthand as multiculturalism, has been found inadequate. Does multiculturalism mean we should be blind to cultural differences or make allowances for cultural differences? Does it mean accepting different legal or cultural standards? Much of the literature revolves around whether multiculturalism can exist as what the British philosopher Lord Parrock called in Britain a community of communities, or whether this vision has led to what UK Prime Minister David Cameron called parallel lives. In the UK, for example, Jewish and Islamic communities are exempt from the requirement to stun animals before slaughtering them. Sikhs don't have to wear helmets on motorbikes and are exempt from the ban on carrying knives in public. In some parts of London, around 70% of primary school children speak English as a second language. And one question that arises from this is whether multiculturalism is at odds with social cohesion. What level of integration is appropriate or desirable? There are several ways you can study this. Residential segregation, overrepresentation in the prison population, identification with national identity, studying friendship circles and office socialising and so on. 
For example, 90% of first immigration immigrants in the UK have spouses of the same ethnicity, membership of the same clubs and in-group friendships and in-group places of worship are also high. Many Asian groups, particularly Pakistani and Bangladeshi, continue to have high levels of in-group marriage and friendship in the second generation. But one study found that at least half of immigrants' acquaintances come from members of the majority population, quote, a finding which supports the existence of these important bridging relationships. But it's also true that, quote, Muslims who follow religious rules and practices tend to have fewer majority acquaintances. In Canada and the US, it's been found that self-reported importance of ethnicity decreases in second-generation immigrants, while identification with the nation increases. And one consistent finding is that minorities, quote, overwhelmingly support maintenance of their own ethnic customs and traditions, alongside equally striking support for mixing and integrating. Another interesting finding is the benefits of being bicultural. This study finds that bicultural individuals show better psychological adjustment as measured by higher life satisfaction and self-esteem and lower alienation, anxiety, depression and loneliness. And a meta-analysis of 51 other studies finds that biculturalism is, quote, positively correlated with a range of behavioural outcomes, such as academic achievement, career success, and reduced delinquency. Another meta-analysis of 83 studies finds bicultural individuals are better adjusted than their monocultural neighbours. Cultural hybridity in the US also seems to correlate with socio-economic success. One move in the literature is from multiculturalism to the idea of interculturalism, the difference being that interculturalism promotes the idea of dialogue, mutual progress, and policies that can try and counter segregation. In Canada, for example, research shows that policies can help immigrants secure better jobs, learn English, can lead to higher incomes, and encourage pathways to citizenship. In all, though, there is little solid evidence that multiculturalism has at all failed. As this review concludes, the most important rationale for the political backlash against multicultural policies that they impede or hurt socio-political integration appears unfounded empirically. One area of research looks at Islam and multiculturalism in particular. A 2016 poll, for example, revealed that more than half of British Muslims think homosexuality should be illegal. 39% said wives should always obey their husbands, compared to 5% of the whole population. 86% though have a strong sense of belonging to Britain. 24% want Sharia law, according to one poll, although it varies what Sharia means. Another poll says 40% want Sharia and only 22% oppose it. One study says that there are roughly 30 to 85 so-called Sharia councils already in the UK that resolve disagreements, usually around marriage. One government review said that from those who gave evidence to the review panel, no one disputed that Sharia councils engage in practices which are discriminatory to women. Another poll found that 37% want to integrate, quote, on most things, but 40% want gender segregation in education. And it's also true that in this context, higher levels of education lead to higher support for democratic values. So, to put it mildly, if you believe in gender and sexuality equality, if you believe in freedom of speech and equality under the law, it's certainly true there are challenges in this area. Now, let's move on and look at undocumented immigration.
Okay, the literature on this is vast, so I'll just touch on a few things that surprised me. It's no revelation, for example, that in many places we're seeing an increase in illegal immigration, and in most countries the trend is towards stopping that increase in some way, whether it's Trump's success in America, or Brexit, or Marine Le Pen, and so on. When it comes to illegal immigration, most people would probably conjure images of migrants crossing waterways on dinghies or climbing border fences, but almost half of undocumented migrants in the US came in legally, then overstayed their visas. Many were brought in as young children and don't even find out they're undocumented until they go to get jobs in adulthood. But the effect of increasing border patrol funding seems negligible. Migrants just find other ways in. For example, this study found that, quote, from 1986 to 2008, the undocumented population of the US grew from 3 million to 12 million persons, despite a five-fold increase in border patrol officers, a four-fold increase in hours spent patrolling the border, and a 20-fold increase in nominal funding. We also forget that being undocumented isn't particularly appealing, and so many don't stay that long. In one study in Thailand, researchers found that in 61 out of 63 surveyed villages, quote, the proportion of overseas workers who voluntarily returned to Thailand was 95% or more. Another study in the Netherlands looked at the psychological burden of being away from home. The more undocumented migrants stay in a country, the more this increases, but I guess that's no surprise. According to another study, quote, more vigorous deportation policy advances the date of voluntary return, which explains the motivation of the hostile environment policy of the Conservative government here in the UK. In fact, if you look at numbers from the UK, the majority seem to leave voluntarily, suggesting that they only intend to stay for a short period of time. Undocumented migrants obviously find it more difficult to find jobs and to contribute taxes. One study in the US found that providing a pathway to citizenship for the roughly 11 million undocumented immigrants in the US would increase their wages and spending power and, over about 10 years, boost US GDP by 1.2 trillion. But many empirical studies have also found that wages of legalised migrants improved after they were granted amnesty. In the UK, many voters have changed political allegiances because of immigration, especially from Labour to Conservative. Now, one impression I get from reading policy papers and editorial suggestions is that left-wing parties have, to quote one paper, struggled to convince the public that they have a grip on the issue. Progressives, liberals and left-wingers need to address what the John Smith Institute calls the public trust deficit. We need to use the facts presented here to craft a positive narrative that doesn't shy away from difficult issues. As we've seen, immigration, like all political topics, clearly has its challenges, but they all seem negligible to me, and part of the problems any host country already has, and governments that pursue multicultural policies and are proactive in making the positive case for immigration particularly Canada, Australia and Scotland, do much better when it comes to public support for immigration. People in Scotland, for example, tend to be more tolerant of asylum seekers in part because leadership prioritises PR campaigns that inform people of the benefits and take control of the narrative. In the UK, on the other hand, the narrative is dominated by the right-wing tabloids. Media exposure to negative narratives have, of course, been found to affect voter preferences. In the UK, when polled, 
people always think migration is much higher than it is. Immigrants make up 10% of France's population, and that number hasn't changed in recent years. But respondents to polls continue to believe immigration is increasing and is too high. In the UK, there were 50,000 asylum applications in 2021, and 15,000 were granted. And 700,000 people are born in the UK each year, so as a percentage, this is very small, but it's true that in 2021, 23,000 crossed the channel illegally in boats and 37 died. I think when looking at the evidence, these numbers should be easily accommodated. But rather than, for example, take up France's offer of a UK asylum processing centre in France that would then likely reduce the numbers crossing the channel illegally, the UK government have declined to take up the offer. The UK has a labour shortage, an ageing population, and a shortage of national health service workers. And 23% of doctors, and almost half of all nurses, were born outside of the UK. We should be welcoming people. And there are plenty of creative policy ideas that get overlooked too. Several studies look at heartland visas for asylum seekers who are willing to settle in deprived areas or areas that are depopulating. Canada and Australia both do this. And Canada receives around 250,000 immigrants each year and does very well. Australia's economy is booming as in recent years it's accepted huge numbers of migrants. More than 30% of the population were born abroad. Again, it does very well. Okay, so what do you think? What have I missed or left out? Have I been biased? Let me know in the comments. Take a look at the sources in the description under the video yourself. Let's work together to build a progressive narrative for the future. Thank you as always for watching, and a huge thanks of course, as always, to my Patreons, without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all, if you just want to help support make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.